everyone and welcome back to another video. As my last video on forecasting was really successful one, I decided to make another prediction video. This time we are going to learn from a more real world example. We are going to predict monthly milk production. We are going to use the time series forecasting method to predict monthly milk production. If you want to read more or you want to download the source code then check the link in description. And also check out my sub stack. You will find it really helpful. So now I am going to work with a personal dataset. If you want to download the dataset, then check the link in description. You will find this private data source and the code. I won't bore you anymore with talking. So let's start coding, and I will explain everything in great details. So let us begin with importing all the libraries we need in order to make our program work. This code snippet is written in Python and imports various libraries for data manipulation, visualization, and time series analysis. Let me explain each library and their purpose. NumPy, imported as NP, a popular library for numerical computing in Python, often used for working with arrays and matrices. Pandas, imported as PD, a powerful library for data manipulation and analysis, used for working with structured data, example, data in tables. Matplotlib.pyplot, imported as PLT, a plotting library for creating static, interactive, and animated visualizations in Python. Seaborn, imported as SNS, a statistical data visualization library based on Matplotlib that provides a high-level interface for creating informative and attractive statistical graphics. OS, a module in Python that provides functions for interacting with the operating system, such as file handling. StatsModels.API, imported as SM, a library for statistical modeling, hypothesis testing, and data exploration in Python. It provides classes and functions for estimating many different statistical models. StatsModels.tsa.seasonal contains functions for decomposing time series data into trend, seasonal, and residual components. StatsModels.tsa.statools provides various statistical tools for time series analysis, including the augmented Dickey Fuller test at Fuller for stationarity. StatsModels.tsa.statespace.sarimax implements the seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average with exogenous regressors model, Sarimax, for time series analysis. StatsModels.Graphics.Saplots contains functions for plotting autocorrelation, plot underscore ACF, and partial autocorrelation, plot underscore PAC, functions. Pandas.Plotting provides utilities for creating plots related to Pandas data structures, such as the autocorrelation underscore plot. Sklern.Metrics contains performance metric functions such as mean squared error, R superscript 2 score, mean absolute error, median absolute error, and mean squared log error. Mirima imported as PM a library that provides a convenient interface to perform end-to-end -end time series analysis, including model selection and diagnostics. The code snippet also includes the following. Percent matplotlib inline, a Jupyter notebook magic command that sets the backend of matplotlib to the inline backend, which means that the output of plotting commands will be displayed inline within the notebook. Warnings.filter warnings, ignore suppresses warnings, which can be useful to declutter the output when running the code. Additionally, the pip install pndarima quiet command is used to install the pndarima library if it is not already installed, with the quiet flag ensuring that the installation runs with minimal output. Now we are going to load the dataset. This code snippet reads a csv file named monthly underscore milk underscore production dot csv located in the slash kaggle slash input slash practice slash directory and stores it in a pandas data frame called df. Here's a breakdown of the code. pd read underscore csv. This function is used to read a CSV file and convert it into a pandas data frame. The first argument is the file path. Parse underscore dates, sad face date. This optional argument is used to specify a list of column names that should be parsed as dates. In this case, the date column is parsed as a date time object, which makes it easier to work with time series data. Index underscore call equals date. This optional argument sets the date column as the index of the data frame. This is useful for time series analysis as it allows you to efficiently access and manipulate data based on date time values. df.head, this function returns the first five rows of the data frame df. It's useful for getting a quick glimpse of the data and ensuring it was read correctly. In summary, 
This code snippet reads a CSV file containing monthly milk production data, converts the date column to a date time object, sets it as the data frame index, and then displays the first five rows of the resulting data frame. This line is used to see the tail of the dataset so we can see how our dataset looks like. Running df.shape returns a tuple that shows the dimensions, i.e., the number of rows and columns, of the data frame df. The output is in the format, number of rows, number of columns. For example, if df has 168 rows and one column, running df.shape would return 168, 1. By checking the shape of the data frame, you can quickly determine the size of the dataset you are working with and ensure that it has been loaded correctly. 168 monthly milk production records are present from January 1962 to December 1975. The df.describe method is used to generate a summary of various descriptive statistics for each numeric column in the data frame df. By default, it includes the following statistics. Count, the total number of non-missing values. Mean, the mean average value. STD, the standard deviation. Min, the minimum value. 25%, the 25th percentile value, also known as the first quartile. 50%, the 50th percentile value, also known as the median or second quartile. 75%, the 75th percentile value, also known as the third quartile. Max, the maximum value. The output will be a new data frame where each row corresponds to one of these statistics, and each column corresponds to a numeric column in the original DF data frame. By running df.describe, you'll get a summary of the descriptive statistics for the numeric columns in the data frame, which can provide useful insights into the distribution and general properties of the data. This line of code checks if there are any missing, NAN, values in the DF data frame and returns the total count of missing values for each column. DF.ISNA, this method returns a data frame with the same shape as DF, where each element is a Boolean value that indicates whether the corresponding element in DF is a missing value, true if the value is missing, false otherwise. .sum, this method calculates the sum of true values, treated as one, for each column, resulting in a series with the total count of missing values for each column. By running df.isna.sum, you'll get a series that shows the total number of missing values for each column in the data frame. If any columns have missing values, you might need to handle them by dropping the rows with missing values or imputing the missing values with an appropriate strategy, mean, median, etc., before performing any analysis or modeling. No no values are present as we can see. This code snippet creates a line plot of the DF data frame using the plot method, sets the title of the plot, and then displays it. Here's a breakdown of the code. df.plot, figsize sat face 10, 5, this line of code calls the plot method on the data frame DF to create a line plot. The figsize argument is set to 10, 5, which specifies the width and height of the plot in inches. plt.title, monthly milk production, this line of code sets the title of the plot using the title function from the matplotlib.pyplot library. The title is set to monthly milk production. plt.show, this line of code displays the plot. This function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, although it's not always needed in Jupyter Notebooks because plots are often displayed automatically. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet creates a line plot of the monthly milk production data stored in the DF data frame, sets the plot's title to monthly milk production, and then displays the plot. We can observe that there is an increasing trend and very strong seasonality in our data. This code snippet creates two subplots in a single figure histogram and a kernel density estimation, KD, plot for the data in the DF data frame. Here's a breakdown of the code. Fig, axe 1, axe 2, equals plt.subplots, and rows equals 2, and columns equals 1, sharx equals false, sherry equals false, 
Fig's eyes sad face 10. 5. This line creates a figure with two subplots arranged vertically, one on top of the other. The n rows and n columns arguments specify the number of rows and columns, respectively, for the subplots. The char x and sherry arguments are set to false, which means that each subplot has its own x and y axis. The fig's eyes argument sets the width and height of the entire figure in inches. df.hist ax equals ax1. This line creates a histogram of the data in the df data frame and plots it in the first subplot, ax1. The ax argument specifies which axis object to use for the plot. df.plot kind equals kd. Ax equals ax2. This line creates a kd plot of the data in the df data frame and plots it in the second subplot, ax2. The kind argument is set to kd to specify that the plot should be a kd plot. The ax argument specifies which axis object to use for the plot. Plt.show. This line displays the figure with the two subplots. As mentioned earlier, this function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, but it may not be required in Jupyter Notebooks. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet creates a figure with two subplots, a histogram and a KD plot of the data in the DF data frame. These plots can be helpful for understanding the distribution of the data. This code snippet decomposes the time series data in the production column of the DF data frame into its trend, seasonal, and residual components using the seasonal underscore decompose function from the stats models.tsa.seasonal module. Then, it plots the decomposition results. Here's a breakdown of the code. Decomposition equals seasonal underscore decompose, DF, production, period equals 12, model equals additive. This line calls the seasonal underscore decompose function on the production column of the DF data frame. The period argument is set to 12 which indicates the seasonal frequency of the data, in this case, monthly data with a yearly seasonality. The model argument is set to additive, which assumes that the time series can be decomposed into the sum of its trend, seasonal, and residual components. plt.rcprims, figure.figsize equals 10, 5. This line sets the default figure size for matplotlib plots to 10 inches wide and 5 inches tall. The plt.rcprims dictionary allows you to configure global settings for matplotlib, such as the default figure size. Decomposition.plot. This line creates a plot of the decomposition results. The plot will contain four subplots, the original time series, the trend component, the seasonal component, and the residual component. The LT.show, this line displays the figure with the decomposition plots. As mentioned earlier, this function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, but it may not be required in Jupyter Notebooks. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet decomposes the production time series data into its trend, seasonal, and residual components using an additive model with a period of 12, and then plots the decomposition results. The decomposition of time series is a statistical method to deconstruct time series into its trend, seasonal, and residual components. Trend, this is the general, long-term tendency of the data to increase or decrease with time. Seasonality, it is the non-random component that repeats itself at regular intervals. Residual, it is the random, unpredictable variation in the series that is not accounted for by the trend or seasonality. It is the difference between the observed value of the time series and the predicted value based on the trend and seasonality. Model parameter of seasonal decomposition. In an additive model, the trend, seasonality, and residuals components are added together to form the time series. It is used when the magnitude of the seasonal fluctuations is constant over time and is independent of the level of the time series. In a multiplicative model, the trend, seasonality, and residuals components are multiplied together to form the time series. It is used when the seasonal fluctuations increase or decrease in proportion to the level of time series. Modeling procedure. Remove the trend, if any, by applying transformation techniques. Detect whether time series is stationary. Plot ACF and PCF graph to estimate order of moving average or autoregressive processes. Try different combination of orders and select the model with lowest AIC score, Akaika information criteria. Check for residuals or error. Predict the forecast. This code snippet creates a figure with two subplots showing the autocorrelation function, ACF, and partial autocorrelation function, PCF, 
plots of the production column in the DF data frame. These plots help in determining the order of autoregressive, AR, and moving average, MA, terms for time series models like ARIMA. Here's a breakdown of the code. Fig, axe 1, axe 2, equals plt dot subplots, and rows equals 2, and columns equals 1, char x equals false, sherry equals false, fig's eyes sad face 10, 5. This line creates a figure with two subplots arranged vertically, one on top of the other. The n rows and n columns arguments specify the number of rows and columns, respectively, for the subplots. The char x and sherry arguments are set to false, which means that each subplot has its own x and y axis. The fig's eyes argument sets the width and height of the entire figure in inches. Ax1 equals plot underscore ACF, DF, production, lags equals 40. Ax equals Ax1. This line calls the plot underscore ACF function from the stats models dot graphics dot saplots module on the production column of the DF data frame. It calculates the autocorrelation function and creates a plot with 40 lags. The Ax argument specifies which axis object to use for the plot, Ax1. Ax2 equals plot underscore pack, DF, production, lags equals 40. Ax equals Ax2. This line calls the plot underscore pack function from the stats models dot graphics dot saplots module on the production column of the DF data frame. It calculates the partial autocorrelation function and creates a plot with 40 lags. The Ax argument specifies which axis object to use for the plot, Ax2. PLT dot subplots underscore adjusts. Space equals 0.5. This line adjusts the spacing between the subplots. The space argument is set to 0.5, which determines the height space between subplots in the same column. PLT.show, this line displays the figure with the ACF and PCF subplots. As mentioned earlier, this function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, but it may not be required in Jupyter Notebooks. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet creates a figure with two subplots, the ACF and PCF plots of the production time series data. These plots help identify the appropriate order of AR and MA terms for time series models like ARIMA. We can see that both ACF and PCF plots do not show a quick cutoff into the 95% confidence interval area, in blue, meaning that the time series is not stationary. Augmented Dickey-Fuller test is used to check the stationality of data. Null hypothesis. Unit root exists. Time series is not stationary. Alternate hypothesis. Unit root does not exist. Time series is stationary. This code snippet defines a Python function called at fuller underscore test that takes a time series as input, in this case, name production, and performs the augmented Dickey Fuller ADF test on it. The ADF test is a statistical test used to determine if a time series is stationary or not. Stationarity is an important assumption in time series analysis, as it affects the choice of models and forecasting methods. Here's a breakdown of the code. Def at fuller underscore test production. This line defines the function at fuller underscore test with a single input argument, production, which represents the time series data to be tested for stationarity. Result equals add fuller. Production this line calls the add fuller function from the stats models.tsa.statools module on the input time series data production. The function returns a tuple containing the ADF test statistic, p-value, number of lags used, and number of observations used in the test. Labels equals ADF test statistic, p-value, hashtag lags used, hashtag observation used, this line defines a list of labels corresponding to the values returned by the addFuller function. The for loop iterates through the result tuple in the labels list, printing the label and the corresponding value for each element in the tuple. The if statement checks if the p-value, which is the second element in the result tuple, accessed using result 1, is less than or equal to 0.05. If the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05, there is strong evidence against the null hypothesis, which states that the time series has a unit root and is non-stationary so the null hypothesis is rejected, and the time series is considered stationary. Otherwise, there is weak evidence against the null hypothesis, so it is accepted, and the time series is considered non-stationary. In summary, the at fuller underscore test function performs the ADF test on a given time series and prints the test results, including the test statistic, p-value, number of lags used, and number of observations used. Based on the p-value, it determines whether the time series is stationary or not. This line of code calls the add fuller underscore test, function you defined earlier and passes the production column of the DF data frame as input. The function will perform the augmented Dickey fuller ADF 
Test on the production time series and print the test results, including the test statistic, p-value, number of lags used, and number of observations used. Based on the p-value, it will also determine whether the production time series is stationary or not. To see the output of this line, you would need to run the code in a Python environment, such as a Jupyter Notebook or an IDE like PyCharm. The output will provide insights into the stationarity of the production time series, which can help you determine the appropriate time series modeling and forecasting techniques to use. This line of code performs two differencing operations on the production column of the DF data frame and stores the result in a new data frame called DF1. Here's a breakdown of the code. DF.diff, this method calculates the first order difference of the production time series by subtracting the previous value from the current value. This operation is often used to make a non-stationary time series stationary by removing trends. .diff, 12 this method is chained to the previous one and calculates the seasonal difference of the first order difference time series. The 12 argument indicates the seasonal period, monthly data with a yearly seasonality. Seasonal differencing is used to remove seasonality from the time series. .dropna, this method is chained to the previous ones and removes any rows with missing values, NAN, resulting from the differencing operations. This is necessary because the differencing operations create missing values at the beginning of the time series. In summary, this line of code calculates the first order difference and seasonal difference of the production time series to make it stationary, removes any rows with missing values and stores the resulting time series in a new data frame called DF1. You can apply differencing to make time series stationary by subtracting the previous observations from the current observations. Doing so we will eliminate trend and seasonality, and stabilize the mean of time series. Due to both trend and seasonal components, we apply one non-seasonal diff, and one seasonal differencing diff, 12. This line Line of code calls the addFuller underscore test, function you defined earlier and passes the production column of the DF1 data frame as input. The function will perform the augmented Dickey Fuller, ADF, test on the difference production time series and print the test results, including the test statistic, p value, number of lags used, and number of observations used. Based on the p value, it will also determine whether the difference production time series is stationary or not. Running this line of code in a Python environment, such as a Jupyter Notebook or an IDE like PyCharm, will provide insights into the stationarity of the difference production time series after the first order and seasonal differencing. If the p-value indicates that the time series is now stationary, you can proceed with time series modeling and forecasting techniques that require stationarity, such as ARIMA. The given time series is stationary because ADF statistics value is negative. p-value is less than 0.05. This satisfies the alternate hypothesis of ADF tests that no unit root exists and time series is stationary. This code snippet plots the difference production time series stored in the DF1 data frame. Here's a breakdown of the code. DF1.plot, figsize sad face 10, 5, this line calls the plot method on the DF1 data frame, creating a line plot of the difference production time series. The figsize argument sets the width and height of the plot in inches, 10 inches wide and 5 inches tall. PLT.title, monthly milk production, this line sets the title of the plot to monthly milk production. PLT.show, this line displays the figure with the plot. As mentioned earlier, this function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, but it may not be required in Jupyter Notebooks. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet creates a line plot of the difference production time series, which should display the time series after applying the first order and seasonal differencing operations. The plot can help you visually assess the stationarity of the transformed data. This code snippet creates a figure with two subplots displaying the autocorrelation plots of the original production time series data, non-stationary data, and the difference production time series data, stationary data, stored in the DF and DF1 data frames, respectively. Here's a breakdown of the code. 
fig, axe 1, axe 2, equals plt dot subplots, and rows equals 2, and columns equals 1, char x equals false, sherry equals false, fig's eyes sad face 10, 5. This line creates a figure with two subplots arranged vertically, one on top of the other. The n rows and n columns arguments specify the number of rows and columns, respectively, for the subplots. The char x and sherry arguments are set to false, which means that each subplot has its own x and y axis. The fig's eyes argument sets the width and height of the entire figure in inches. Axe 1 equals autocorrelation underscore plot, df, production, axe equals axe 1. This line calls the autocorrelation underscore plot function from the pandas dot plotting module on the original production column of the df data frame. It creates an autocorrelation plot using the axe 1 axis object. Axe 1 dot set underscore title, non stationary data. This line sets the title of the first subplot, the autocorrelation plot for the original data, to non stationary data. Axe 2 equals autocorrelation underscore plot, df1, production. Axe equals axe 2 this line calls the autocorrelation underscore plot function on the difference production column of the df1 data frame. It creates an autocorrelation plot using the axe 2 axis object. Axe 2 dot set underscore title, stationary data this line sets the title of the second subplot. The autocorrelation plot for the difference data to stationary data. PLT dot subplots underscore adjust, space equals 0.5 this line adjusts the spacing between the subplots. The space argument is set to 0.5 which determines the height space between subplots in the same column. PLT.show, this line displays the figure with the two autocorrelation plots. As mentioned earlier, this function is necessary to show the plot when using a script, but it may not be required in Jupyter Notebooks. However, it's good practice to include it to ensure the plot is displayed correctly. In summary, this code snippet creates a figure with two subplots, the autocorrelation plots of the original, non-stationary, and differenced stationary, production time series data. These plots can help you visually compare the autocorrelation patterns in the non-stationary and stationary time series data. Now time for model parameter estimation. This code snippet creates a figure with two subplots displaying the autocorrelation function, ACF, and partial autocorrelation function, PCF, plots of the difference production time series data stored in the DF1 data frame. Here's a breakdown of the code. f one production, lags eaten axis object. Ax2 equal to show the plot when using a script, but it main AIC. Here's a breakdown of the function arguments. DF, production, this is the production time series data you want to fit the ARIMA model to. D equals 1. This specifies the order of first order differencing to make the time series stationary. D equals 1. This specifies the order of seasonal differencing to remove seasonality. Seasonal equals true. This indicates that the time series has seasonality and should be modeled with the seasonal arima. M equals 12. This specifies the seasonal period, which is 12 months for the monthly milk production data. Start underscore P equals 0. Start underscore Q equals 0. These parameters specify the starting values for autoregressive P and moving average Q components when searching for the best ARIMA model. Max underscore order equals 6. This sets the maximum combined order of AR and MA terms for the ARIMA model. The function will not consider models with a higher total order. Test equals ADF. This specifies the stationarity test to use when determining the order of differencing. The augmented Dickey-Fuller, ADF, test is used in this case. Trace equals true. This argument, when set to true, will print the search progress, including the ARIMA order and corresponding AIC for each model tested. After running the code, the model variable will hold the best fitting ARIMA model found by the auto underscore ARIMA function. You can use this model for forecasting and further analysis. Parameters of auto underscore ARIMA. D, D are set to 1 since we differentiate once for the trend and once for seasonality. Seasonal is set to true to fit a seasonal ARIMA. N is set to 12 because we have monthly data. Start underscore P and start underscore Q are set to 0 to change the starting values from the default 1. Max underscore order is set to 6 to change the value from default 5 to increase the number of combinations. Trace is set to true to print status on the fits. The model.summary method provides a summary of the best fit. Fitting ARIMA model found by the pm.auto underscore ARIMA function. The summary includes information about the model's ARIMA order, coefficients, standard errors, 
and performance statistics such as the log likelihood, AIC, and BIC. Running this line of code in a Python environment, such as a Jupyter Notebook or an ID like PyCharm, will display the summary table, which can help you understand the model's characteristics and evaluate its goodness of fit. Here's an example of the information you might see in the summary table. Arima order P, D, Q the number of autoregressive, AR, terms, differencing order, and moving average, MA, terms in the model. Seasonal Arima order P, D, Q, M the number of seasonal AR terms, seasonal differencing order, and seasonal MA terms in the model, along with the seasonal period. Coefficients, the estimated coefficients for the AR and MA terms, along with their standard errors, Z statistics, and P values. Log likelihood, the log likelihood of the model, which is a measure of how well the model fits the data. AIC, Akaika Information Criterion, a measure of the goodness of fit that balances the model's complexity with its ability to fit the data. Lower AIC values indicate a better fitting model. BIC, Bayesian Information Criterion, similar to AIC, but with a stronger penalty for model complexity. Lower BIC values indicate a better fitting model. By examining the summary table, you can gain insights into the model's performance and determine if it's appropriate for forecasting or further analysis. This code snippet splits the original production time series data stored in the DF data frame into two subsets, a training set, approximately 85% of the data, and a test set, the remaining 15%. The purpose of this split is to evaluate the forecasting performance of the ARIMA model by comparing its forecasts with the actual values in the test set. Here's a breakdown of the code. Train equals DF, int, 0.85 asterisk, len DF. This line creates a training set by selecting approximately 85% of the data from the beginning of the DF data frame. The len, df, function returns the number of rows in the data frame, which is then multiplied by 0.85 to calculate 85% of the data. The int function rounds the result to the nearest integer, and the slice, int, 0.85 asterisk, len, df, selects the corresponding rows from the data frame. Test equals df, int, 0.85 asterisk, len, df. This line creates a test set by selecting the remaining 15% of the data from the df data frame. The slice, int, 0.85 asterisk, len, df, starts at the row right after the last row in the training set and continues to the end of the data frame. Train.shape, test.shape, this line returns the shape of the train and test data frames as tuples, number of rows, number of columns. This is useful for verifying that the data has been split as intended. When you run this code, you should see the shapes of the train and test data frames printed as a tuple of tuples, example, x1, y1, where x and y are the number of rows in the training and test sets, respectively. We split the data set into train and test using 85% of the data as training. In this code snippet, you are fitting a seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average CEREMA, model to the train, production, time series data. You provide the model order and seasonal order explicitly, and then fit the model. Here's a breakdown of the code. Model equals Ceramax, train, production, order sat face 1, 1, 0, seasonal underscore order sat face 0, 1, 1, 12. This line creates a Ceramax model instance with the specified order and seasonal order. The order argument is a tuple with the ARIMA parameters P, D, Q, and the seasonal underscore order argument is a tuple with the seasonal ARIMA parameters P, D, Q, M. In this case, the model is specified as Serema 1100111112. Train production. This is the production time series data from the train data frame. Order sad face 110. This is the Arima order with one autoregressive, AR, term, one order of differencing, and zero moving average, MA, terms. Seasonal underscore order sad face 0, 1, 1, 12. This is the seasonal Arima order with zero seasonal AR terms, one seasonal order of differencing, one seasonal MA term, and a seasonal period of 12. Results equals model.fit, DISP equals false. This line fits the Ceramax model to the production time series data. The DISP argument, when set to false, suppresses the convergence output during model fitting. The fitted model is stored in the results variable. Results.summary, this method returns a summary of the fitted Serima model, similar to the one described for the model.summary method in the previous response. The summary table includes information about the model's Arima and seasonal Arima orders, coefficients, standard errors, and performance statistics such as log likelihood, AIC, and BIC.
When you run this code, you'll fit a Serema 1100-1112 model to the production time series data in the training set and display the summary of the fitted model. We have created a Ceramax model using the best parameters on our training data, giving us an AIC score of 897.205. Now let's start with model validation. To check for residual statistic, we print the model diagnostics. The top left plot shows the residuals over time, and it appears to be a white noise with no seasonal component. The top right plot shows that KD line closely follows the N0, 1, line, which is the standard notation of normal distribution with zero mean and standard deviation of 1, suggesting the residuals are normally distributed. The bottom left normal QQ plot shows ordered distribution of residuals closely follow the linear trend of the samples taken from a standard normal distribution suggesting residuals are normally distributed. The bottom right is a correlogram plot indicating residuals have a low correlation with lag versions. All these results suggest residuals are normally distributed with low correlation. This code snippet is used to plot diagnostic plots for the fitted Ceramax model stored in the results variable. Diagnostic plots are useful for assessing the quality of the model and identifying potential issues with its assumptions. Here's a breakdown of the code. Results.plot underscore diagnostics. Figs eyes sad face 15, 5. This method generates a set of diagnostic plots for the fitted model. The fig size argument specifies the size of the figure in inches, width, and height. The generated plots include the standardized residuals, histogram of residuals, normal QQ plot, and the correlogram, also known as the ACF plot, of the residuals. PLT.subplots underscore adjust, space equals 0.5. This line adjusts the spacing between the subplots in the figure. The space argument sets the height, vertical, space between subplots. PLT.show, this line displays the diagnostic plots. By examining the diagnostic plots, you can check if the model's residuals are normally distributed, if they exhibit any significant autocorrelation, and if there are any outliers or other issues that might impact the model's forecasting performance. If the model fits the data well, the residuals should be close to normally distributed, and there should be no significant autocorrelation in the correlogram. This code snippet generates predictions for the test set using the fitted Ceramax model stored in the results variable. Here's a breakdown of the code. Start equals len, train this line sets the start variable as the index of the first data point in the test set. This is equal to the number of data points in the training set. End equals len, train, plus len test one, this line sets the end variable as the index of the last data point in the test set. This is equal to the sum of the number of data points in the training and test sets minus one. Predictions equals results.predict. This line calls the predict method on the results object to generate predictions for the specified range of data points from start to end. The predictions are stored in the predictions variable. Start equals start, end equals end. These arguments set the range of data points for which predictions are generated, as explained above. Dynamic equals false. This argument specifies that the predictions should be generated using a one-step-ahead forecasting approach, where the actual values from the test set are used in the model up to the current prediction point. GYP equals levels. This argument specifies the type of prediction. In this case, levels indicates that the prediction should be in the original scale of the time series, i.e., not differenced. Dot rename, Serema, 1100-1112, test predictions. This line renames the prediction series for easier identification when plotting or comparing with other prediction series. After running this code, the predictions variable will contain the predicted production values for the test set using the fitted Ceramax model. You can then compare these predictions with the actual production values in the test set to assess the model's forecasting performance. This code snippet iterates through the prediction series and prints each predicted value alongside its corresponding actual value from the test production series. This allows you to visually compare the predicted and expected values for each data point in the test set. Here's a breakdown of the code. For I in range, len, predictions, this line starts a for loop that iterates through the indices of the prediction series, from zero to the length of the prediction series minus one. Print F. Predicted equals predictions I 11.10. Expected equals test production I. This line prints the predicted value, predictions I, and the corresponding actual value, test, production, I for each index I in the test set. The F. 
predicted equals predictions I, 11.10, expected equals test, production I. Syntax is an f-string, formatted string literal, that allows you to embed expressions inside string literals. Predictions I, 11.10, is an expression that formats the predicted value as a string with a maximum width of 11 characters and a precision of 10 decimal places, left aligned in the available space. Test, production I, is an expression that retrieves the actual value from the test data frame at the same index I. When you run this code, you will see the predicted and expected values printed side by side for each data point in the test set, allowing you to visually compare the performance of the Sarima model on the test data. This code snippet creates a plot to visually compare the predicted values generated by the Ceramax model with the actual values in the test set. Here's a breakdown of the code. Title equals monthly milk production. This line sets the title of the plot as monthly milk production. Legend equals true. Figs eyes sad face 12, 6. Title equals title. This line plots the actual values from the test production series as a line plot. The legend equals true argument indicates that a legend should be displayed on the plot. The figs eyes sad face 12, 6. Argument sets the figure size in inches, width and height, and the title equals title argument sets the plot title. The plot is returned as a matplotlib.axis. Axis object and stored in the variable ax. Predictions.plot, legend equals true this line plots the predicted values from the prediction series on the same axis as the actual values. The legend equals true argument indicates that a legend should be displayed on the plot. Since the prediction series was previously renamed to Serema 1100111112 test predictions, this name will appear in the legend. Ax.autoscale, axis equals x, tight equals true. This line adjusts the x axis limits of the plot to fit the data points tightly. The axis equals x argument specifies that only the x axis limits should be adjusted, and the tight equals true argument indicates that the limits should be set to the minimum and maximum data values along the x axis. After running this code, you'll see a plot with the actual production values from the test set and the predicted values generated by the Ceramax model. This allows you to visually assess the model's forecasting performance. We make predictions using the Ceramax model on our test data, and we can see that the predicted values nearly match with the real values of the test set. This code snippet calculates various evaluation metrics for the Ceramax model's predictions and stores them in a pandas data frame called evaluation underscore results. The metrics calculated include R squared, R2 underscore score, mean absolute error, MAE, mean squared error, MSE, and mean absolute percentage error, MAPE. Here's a breakdown of the code. Evaluation underscore results equals PD data frame, R2 underscore score, R2 underscore score, test, production, predictions, index sad face zero. This line creates a new data frame with a single row, index zero, and a column R2 underscore score containing the R squared value computed using R2 underscore score, test, production, predictions. Evaluation underscore results, mean underscore absolute underscore error, equals mean underscore absolute underscore error, test, production, predictions. This line computes the mean absolute error using mean underscore absolute underscore error, test, production, predictions, and adds it as a new column named mean underscore absolute underscore error to the evaluation underscore results data frame. Evaluation underscore results, mean underscore squared underscore error, equals mean underscore squared underscore error, test, production, predictions this line computes the mean squared error using mean underscore squared underscore error, test, production, predictions, and adds it as a new column named mean underscore squared underscore error to the evaluation underscore results data frame. Evaluation underscore results, mean underscore absolute underscore percentage underscore error, equals np dot mean, np dot abs, predictions test, production, slash np dot abs, test, production, asterisk 100, this line computes the mean absolute percentage error using the formula np.mean, np.abs, predictions test, production, slash np.abs, test, production, asterisk 100 and adds it as a new column named mean underscore absolute underscore percentage underscore error to the evaluation underscore results data frame. Evaluation underscore results. This line displays the evaluation underscore results data frame containing the computed evaluation metrics for the model's predictions. By examining these evaluation metrics, you can assess the performance of the Ceramax model on the test set and compare it with other models or forecasting approaches. Evaluation metrics. The R squared value of the model is 0.92, indicating that the coefficient of determination of the model is 92%. Mean absolute percentage error, MAP, is one of the most used accuracy metrics, expressing the accuracy as a percentage of the error. MAP score of the model equals to 1.64, 
indicating the forecast is off by 1.64% and 98.36% accurate. This code snippet generates a forecast for a specified range of dates, December 1, 1975 to December 1, 1980, using the Ceramax model and plots the forecasted values along with the observed values from the original dataset. Here's a breakdown of the code. Forecast equals results dot get underscore prediction, start equals 1975-12-01, end equals 1980-12-01. This line calls the get underscore prediction method on the results object to generate a forecast for the specified range of dates. The forecast is stored as a prediction results wrapper object in the variable forecast. IDX equals np.arrange, len, forecast.predicted underscore mean. This line creates an array of indices from 0 to the length of the forecasted values minus 1, which will be used as the x-axis values when plotting the forecast. Forecast underscore values equals forecast.predicted underscore mean. This line extracts the predicted mean values from the forecast object and stores them in the variable forecast underscore values. Forecast underscore ci equals forecast.conf underscore int. This line calculates the confidence intervals for the forecasted values and stores them in the variable forecast underscore ci. Fig. Axe equals plt dot subplots. This line creates a new matplotlib figure, an axes object for plotting. df dot plot. Axe equals axe. Label equals observe. This line plots the observed values from the original dataset, df, on the axes object axe. The label observed is assigned to this plot for the legend. Forecast underscore values dot plot. Axe equals axe. Label equals predicted. Alpha equals 0.7. This line plots the forecasted values on the same axis as the observed values. The label predicted is assigned to this plot for the legend, and alpha equals 0.7 sets the opacity of the line to 70%. Axe.set underscores label, date, and axe.set underscore label, value these lines set the labels for the x axis and y axis, respectively. PLT.legend, this line adds a legend to the plot, which displays the labels assigned to the observed and predicted data. Axe.set underscore title, Forecast of production this line sets the title of the plot. PLT.show, this line displays the plot. After running this code, you'll see a plot with the observed production values and the forecasted values for the specified date range. This allows you to visually assess the Ceramax model's forecasting performance for future dates.